Now, there are lots of high-tech things going on. Uh, this is the way I usually do it. This microphone is because this course is going to be podcast. I suppose that's going to be fun and helpful. We don't know. I don't know yet how it's going to turn out. One result is that I've taken into the course everybody on the waiting list. I don't know if it's actually on the screen yet, but uh, are there people here who are on the waiting list? And, and did, have you looked to see lately? Are you in the course now? Or are you still? Okay. Well, you're all there. There were something like 35 people on the waiting list. Up to the podcast event, I thought we couldn't put them all in here because there were already 200 people in the course. But now I figure, just guessing, how many people are going to not come to lectures because they're going to be out listening while they're jogging or something, uh, and I have no idea. So I took in the people on the waiting list, I got an extra TA, and I'm just guessing that about... Uh, 15% or something of you at any given day won't be here. Uh, I would love to have you all here. And I, and I, there are empty seats around a bit, over here, for instance, and so forth. For people who don't, if you don't want to stand in the doorway, just take them. And there are seats in there, too. Uh, I'd like to have everybody. It's very nice to have a room full of people who are, I hope, paying attention and talking to me. One of the things I care a lot about is to carry on the course as if it was just one big discussion section. Feel free to raise your hand and interrupt me and to ask me if I'm not being clear or tell me if you think there's something that would be an even better way to say what I'm saying or tell me that the text doesn't fit what I'm saying or tell me where the text fits what I'm saying and I don't even realize it. And the same holds for the teaching assistants. I mean, everybody should be in on this discussion. Uh, and the, that's and it's better by far to be here than to be listening to it passively, even passively if you're, if you're jogging, than actively paying attention so that you can take part. Okay, let's see. I had a list of things that I needed to tell you about before I actually start telling you about the content of the course. In a, in a course in our department, in the philosophy department, we don't have sections the first week. The way we assign people the sections is that on Thursday the five teaching assistants will put their possible section times on the board, and then we'll have people raising their hand who want to each of these times. And when everything, when the dust clears, we hope that there will be a time, there better be, that every, each of you can come. I think that's not a problem with five TAs, each with four times on the board. Uh, so then we'll sort you into that. We'll pass out cards. You put down your first, second, and third choice of the times that are left on the board after we erase the ones that nobody cares about. And then that means then you'll be in discussion sections. Then we'll send email, I presume, in the latest way the world, the world runs, telling you where and when. And we, you start coming to sections next week. It's important to come to discussion sections. I try to reflect it in the grading, but it's in a kind of uh, uh, non-mathematical way. There are three papers in an exam. It just makes sense to say that those are each worth 25%. Uh, but there is a kind of 10% fudge factor in there. That is, if you've been coming to discussion sections and you're on the borderline between, say, an A- minus and a B plus, then we'll put you up or if your papers have shown steady improvement, will put you higher. And if, it, if you haven't been coming to sections or have just been sitting there like a lump, we'll put you lower. So, there, but, so the discussion sections count. It's just kind of impressionistic how they count. To say that they count exactly 10% doesn't make any sense to me. Any questions so far? I mean, nothing I've said seems very controversial yet. Okay, let's see if anything gets any more controversial. Uh, get the books that are on the syllabus. It's important to get the same translation. The one, that presumably, if the bookstore is doing its job, they've got the translation that I asked for and that we're all going to have. It's important because the way I like to teach is to constantly refer to the text and to read passages from the text that either support what I'm saying or are so obscure that they need to be uh, discussed and explained. And if you don't, if you have a different translation, you won't know where I'm at because I can't give page numbers for all the different translations. So get the one that the bookstore has and that the syllabus 
has. Did all of you get syllabi finally when the when the they got it settled? Anybody hasn't got? Uh, okay, I'm sorry. The, the, it's on the website. Uh, I don't know what the URL is, but you can look look over the shoulder of somebody who has a syllabus, and you'll see at the bottom the website, and from that you can find uh, the the syllabus. Anything? Okay, let's go on. Uh, and the reading for next time is the. Don't start at the beginning of the fear and trembling. Don't read the preface by uh, Alistair Haney, who's a very nice guy and a good friend of mine and has written a terrific translation, but I don't think he understands Kierkegaard very well. And I think that it will, I think it will confuse you to read his introduction. I don't think it will help you. So, uh, and don't read Kierkegaard's introduction either. I can't say that he doesn't understand, but I can say that I've never understood the point of the part called the attunement. Uh, it's a possible paper topic to, for anybody who does understand the, why Kierkegaard is telling the Abraham story in five different versions in the it, attunement. That's good. I have ideas, but we don't need it. What It really gets to the heart of things when it gets to the preamble from the heart. It's, by the way, typical of Alistair Haney's good translation. The standard translation up to three years ago called this section preliminary expectoration. Now, why, why is Kierkegaard clearing his throat and spitting at the reader? Well, apparently, if you, you can also read the Danish to mean uh, preamble from the heart, and that makes a lot more sense because that's exactly what it turns out to be. It's Kierkegaard telling you the intense uh, romantic love experience that he's had that has made him rush off to Berlin and write this book. So we're going to read from 57 to 82. Purple chalk, my favorite color. I wonder if you can see it. SK, not very well. Boy, we've got fancy chalk here. Lime colored, purple. How about this? Okay, so we're going to read from 57 to 82. Preamble from the heart. It's hard to understand. Don't be worried. How do you spell heart? But you're going to get used to the fact that I can't spell. I'll tell you right now. I'm dyslexic. I invent new ways to spell everything every time I write it down. You Feel free to raise your hand and ask me what I wrote or tell me how to spell what I wrote. Okay, so don't be upset if this, turn, if this is very strange, hard reading. Uh, that's what we're going to be in the lecture to, and class to straighten it out. It's an unfortunate fact that this is the hardest book in the course. Reassure yourself as you read it that it's never going to get any harder than this. I would put this book much later in the course, but I can't. Everything comes from this book. Kierkegaard is the first existential thinker, and you have to start where things start. So that's about it for the for introduction. Now I'm going to try to tell you stuff about the course so that you can decide whether you want to stay here or do something else. By the way, there's still empty seats over there, uh, and in here. These are going to be hard to get to. Those are easy to get to. So anybody feel free to walk up and take seats around there or on the edge of the st uh, stage up here. Uh, you shouldn't have to be sitting on the floor and certainly not standing in the doorway. Okay. Now, the next thing is sort of a question of truth and advertising. This is called a philosophy course, but it's not like any other philosophy course in the department. Uh, or in any philosophy department, probably. It's, and it's, but that's all right. In fact, it's necessary. The existentialists, as I'll explain as I go on, don't really consider themselves philosophers. They are sort of anti-philosophers. So what they're going to do is certainly going to look very different than what philosophers do. Philosophers try to find the argument in the text they're reading and the reasons that the, the, the philosopher writing the text has for make, believing that what he's claiming is, or she is claiming is true, and then see if you're convinced by those reasons. All of that is very different. People like Kierkegaard and Dostoevsky and Nietzsche write out of some experience. 
some extremely important experience for them, out of which they understand really what human beings are and what life is all about. And they can't justify that experience or argue for it. They can show you the way the world looks to somebody who's had that experience. And our job then isn't to find their arguments and to see if they're sound and true. Our job is to find this this fundamental revelation that's behind each of these books and see how all the things that the author says follow from it. But that means that you won't find that in any other philosophy course. That's just that, uh, and I tell you this just because you, I, mean you, I hope you want to go on in philosophy, but you mustn't go on in philosophy expecting that there's going to be any other philosophy course like this. And uh, it's philosophy is exciting and different. But for, for me, this is very interesting and important. And the wonderful thing about philosophy is you can do anything. You can think about anything. You can do the philosophy of film or physics. You can do existential philosophy. And uh, it all counts in, in, in a departmental way. This is different. I mean, there's a way of doing philosophy. I am not going to, don't, don't want to contradict myself, which is uh, giving arguments and defending them. But there is a kind of rubric, a kind of name for our department uh, where anything goes. And that's, that also is true, that... Philosophy is thinking about anything. And so you'll find lots of other interesting things in the department. You just won't find people thinking about some fundamental re revealing experience that they've had. So, uh, let's see now. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. One, you got this revealing experience. Two, Existential thinkers believe that a person's understanding of themselves and their world is too embodied and pervasive and the background of all their experience such that they can never present it fully and explicitly like a system or like a set of propositions which express what they believe or describe what they've experienced. The, the equivalent of that is that it, what it is to be masculine or feminine, for instance, in a culture, is so built into the way people stand and the way people walk and who gets to look who in the eyes and who gets to enter what sort of conversations and whether you can throw a baseball and so forth. It gets so pervasive and so embodied that you can't get clear about it. You can get somewhat clear about it. There used to be consciousness raising groups when I first came out to Berkeley, where first women and then men too, in the, each in their own groups, met to try to get clear about what it is to be gendered, masculine or feminine in our culture. But, and they sort of, I think, don't, don't exist much anymore, if I'm not mistaken. And my only interpretation, it can't be because people figured it out now, and they don't have to do it anymore. I think they became, I think if I were doing it, I, I think they would come to understand that, what's, that what it is is so deep and so pervasive that it helps to know some of these things that you can describe. But the most important, you can't just articulate. And that's another aspect of why these existential writers don't try to do philosophy. They understand that they can tell you, describe to you, the world of a person who's had this experience and who's living in a certain way without telling you in, in propositions the person believes this and this and this, because it doesn't much matter what they believe any more than it matters much to understand masculine and feminine by understanding, going around and taking a poll about what men believe and women believe. It's what they're getting at is deeper. You can't tell it. You've got to show it. Kierkegaard has a whole theory about this, which he calls indirect communication, in which he doesn't write in his own name most of the time. And the oddest thing of all, but I can't go into it, but this is where Alistair Haney goes wrong and lots of people. When Kierkegaard does write in his own name, he, def he presents and defends an experience and a view which isn't his and which he thinks is wrong and leads to despair. It's when he's writing in, in, under other names that he tells you what he really feels. And, uh, and this book is written by Johannes de Salentio, not by Kierkegaard, I mean, in, in this pseudonym version. Kierkegaard claims just to 
the, I think, the editor of it. I forget what he says he is. But uh, in any case, he's writing from a point of view which uh, he thinks he can't express to you directly and explicitly, but show you, again, how the world looks to somebody who's had this kind of overwhelming experience that he's had. And let's see now. So, and just to to tell you roughly, and and Kierkegaard's experience is romantic love. It's the total commitment and devotion of a lad for the princess, as he puts it, or the knight for the princess. It comes out, we'll go back to this, it comes out of chivalric romances. But what's such a genius, Kierkegaard is such a genius that he turns this sort of, sort of trite and, and you'd think already, already used up experience into a whole new way of understanding human beings in the world. That's what he's doing in, in Fear and Trembling. And Dostoevsky has also a kind of seemingly tried experience, namely what's called agape love or charity, Christian love of your neighbor, which is, again, one would think sort of talked about so much and that it's kind of used up. But Dostoevsky has a whole new take on what it is to experience that. And then Nietzsche has an experience so special that we don't have any normal name for it. He had to give it his own name for it. He's, he experiences the death of God, and he claims to be the, the first one to have seen that the, that the Western God is dead and draw the conclusions from that. Uh, and so we'll, but you'll see all this more when we get into the particular experiences. Uh, oh, I wrote down here, but I didn't say it. This idea that what these people are trying to say is so close to them and so pervasive in their world and so embodied in everything they see and do that they can't just say it is something. Yeats, in the last, one of the last things he did, a letter he wrote, says, he, he says, man can embody truth but cannot know it. I mean, that's sort of what I think all these people have in common and why they write kind of things they write. Anybody want to say anything about that? Because that's my first statement, just what's peculiar about what we're reading. And, and uh, go ahead. I won't, I won't say anything about that yet. Save it till we get to the, the brothers, because if we talk about it now, you've read it, but there are a lot of people who haven't read it, and we'll lose them if we talk about it. Yeah? Um, I was wondering whether or not it sucks. Ah, okay. That's a terrific question. Uh, in fact, that's next on my list. You're the perfect straight person. It says, uh, why not read the usual existentialist, for example, Sartre? Okay, there's a long story to be told about that. Sartre is the last of a whole series of existential thinkers. And in a certain way, he's the most derivative and the least radical. But to tell you where he fits in and why we don't read him, I will sort of give you a list of existential thinkers so you can see why. I mean, Sartre, this won't mean much to you, I'm afraid, to say this, but I'll say it. Sartre takes... Uh, well, no, I won't say it yet anyway. I'll say it in a minute. It won't, it'll mean even less if I say it in that right now. So there's Pascal. He's the first. In 1650, Pascal, who's a generation after Descartes, goes sort of totally head-to-head against Descartes, who is the philosopher's philosopher after Plato there's probably no philosopher as important as Descartes for giving us in the, in the West a certain understanding of what we are. So this is, pa- Pascal is anti-Descartes, where Descartes 
has a whole lot of views that are characteristic of philosophers, which I'll tell you about in a minute. I, I can't jump in and say it yet. But every, Descartes stands for something like looking at everything from a detached, disembodied, theoretical, reflective perspective. And Pascal thinks that you don't find out important things about human beings that way. Uh, and says uh, amazing things that are way ahead of his time, like that, that we never have an experience of God, that God is always hidden, and therefore you have to uh, believe in God by a, a kind of leap. And these are things that became sort of Kierkegaard, for one, and Dostoevsky, too, are very influenced by Pascal. Another thing Pascal said I'll come back to is, and very existentialist thing, is custom is our nature. That is, there's no human nature. We give ourselves the nature that our culture has uh, made up, so to speak, for interpreting human beings, and a million other important things. So there's Pascal, and then after Pascal, sort of standing on his shoulders, is Kierkegaard. Because interestingly enough, nothing much happens with, with Pascal for, what is it, 300 years or 200 years? 200 years. And then Kierkegaard takes, takes it up and, for instance, explains a lot about what he thinks is wrong with the philosophical detached point of view. Kierkegaard is anti-Hegel. They've all, existentialists are always anti some philosopher. They, they can't really think philosophically without think existentially without having some philosopher to be against. And after Kierkegaard, standing on, sort of not on Kierkegaard's shoulders, but sort of doing things on his own, I guess I should have put that so I could put it up there. But now I can't put it up there, so I'll go over here. Okay, after Kierkegaard, and then another hundred years, almost. Uh, well, no, sorry, we got another one in there. But so, yeah, look at that. Okay, <laughs> so uh, uh, then there's Nietzsche, which I can spell, N-I-E-T-Z-S-C-H-E, which is probably more than most of you can do. But it's, ta it's taken me years. I hope I got it right. Uh, let's see, 1886, and I don't know, I'm trying to think, who's Nietzsche's big enemy? Who, who's he writing against? Wagner is sort of, yeah, but that's, a, that's right. But, and that's a kind of, but there was a kind of, that's not philosophical enough. Who was his enemy philosopher? Schopenhauer is, the, is tied up with the Wagner thing. There isn't any. One, you're all, all he's against all of them. And, and of course, and Plato and Socrates and, and so forth. I think maybe his biggest enemy is in a way Socrates. We're going to read the part where he says that Socrates is a degenerate that has undermined and ruined Greek culture and us and everything. I, I guess if it has to be anybody, it's Socrates. Because I don't know any place where, I mean, he has plenty to say against Wagner, but that's a sort of a, a more kind of inner squabble. Okay, then after that, Heidegger, whom I teach several courses on, because he's the one who... Uh, made uh, Kierkegaard into a kind of philosophical system, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche. He draws them together. He puts them into something like philosophical language, but it's anti-philosophy. But it's anti-philosophy much more in a philosophical form. Heidegger's main book is 1927, Being in Time. And then, finally, sorry. So we got over here, Being in Time. Sartre, while he's a prisoner of war in Germany, has, uh, writes, and publishes, writes and then publishes at the end of the war in 1945, being a nothingness. Now I can put this up and cover this up as quickly as possible. There we go. Ah, oh no, that's me. Okay, so now I'm still coming back to your question. Sartre is at the end of all this, he hasn't got much that they haven't said already, and that's bad enough. I mean, enough reason for not reading it, though he has great examples for what he's doing. He's very good at describing cases that, that support what he's doing. The real trouble with Sartre is that he, being French, 
can't help but live inside of the thinking of Descartes. So that what he does is take Heidegger and write Heidegger in a way that you could write Heidegger and still be a Cartesian. And that's disastrous, because Heidegger's big enemy, I didn't write him on there, is, well, Husserl and Descartes. I won't write them up there. But anyway, so Sartre is the least, is the most derivative and the least radical of the people, of, of the philosophers. Um, and okay, that's, that's my answer to why Sartre. Is there somebody else you think wonder why he's not in here? Nobody's going to come to the defense of Camus? I mean, the other person, yeah. Uh, Simone de Beauvoir is, is interesting, but she's very close to Sartre. I mean, they've got a view that's, that they, you know, they naturally have a lot in common, having talked to each other for a long time. And Simone de Beauvoir is interesting, and she's interesting particularly as a feminist early on, but not, not at the level of these people. Uh, yeah. No, again, I'm not, I don't know much Unamuno, but I have a feeling that, that he hasn't got anything really new to say that these big deal people haven't already said. No, let me just talk about Camus. I'm just amazed. Don't you read The Stranger still? How many have read The Stranger? Yeah, you see. Okay. And don't, how many was, were told that this is existentialism? Okay, well, then I better deal with it. Why not more Camus? Why not The Plague or uh, The Fall? Maybe you read that too. How many read The Plague? How many read The Fall? Less probably. Okay, well, you've read a lot of Camus. Why, isn't, why am I just ignoring him? Well, it's because Camus isn't an existentialist in spite of what people may have told you. And, of course, that depends on how you define it. But Camus says he isn't. He says he's a pagan. I think that's right. That is, I think all the existentialists are within the Judeo-Christian tradition. I'll explain that and why I say that in a minute. But they believe in a God who's the supreme being, who, or, uh, the, did I? sorry, I haven't said that right. No, the existentialists don't believe that. They are in, they are in opposition to a culture that has as its one of its fundamental beliefs that there is a supreme being that makes everything intelligible, that gives moral law, that, uh, that, and that it, it, thanks to the supreme being, we can find out what to do and everything will make sense and not be contradictory and so forth. And we, the, the culture lived off that for a long time. But Camus, and we can call that the absolute, this absolute source of meaning, absolute authority, you can count on it to make sense of the world and make sense of your life. Now, Camus certainly denies there is any such absolute. You see it in The, in the Stranger and in The Plague. I mean, he's, he's definitely against the whole Judeo-Christian tradition. But he thinks that the way you should fix it is just get over the problem of seeking an absolute. So reduce your demands. Why should we think that there's going to be that kind of answer. Why should we need that kind of answer? Can't we just appreciate the, the little things lie, lie on the beach in Algeria and at the, as at the end of the stranger, appreciate all the way the world is even though you're going to die? And that's fine. That's, that's, but that's, not an, the exist, that's a kind of pre-Christian attitude. That's why he says he's a pagan. People could live like the stranger learned to live at the end of the book in, in any culture, any culture but our culture, because our culture has gotten addicted, Nietzsche would say, we've got, we're, we're, we're sort of absolute junkies. That is, we've gotten so used to understanding everything in terms of a supreme being and creation and so forth that you can't just get over it. You, Camus' idea is you just get over it. You stop expecting the kind of answer that we thought we've had for 2,000 years. And that's pre-Christian, as I say. Uh, and it's impossible to take it seriously now, I think. Or at least it would be impossible for Kierkegaard or Dostoevsky or Sartre or Heidegger to take it seriously now because they all think that though it turns out there isn't any such absolute, we have become defined 
in terms of the need for it, because once we thought we had it, and it gave us this amazing world in which everything made sense, and we knew what to do, and we knew that virtue was rewarded, and vice was punished, and so forth. Once you've lived in a world like that, like the, the medievals did, it, it's something that Nietzsche thinks anyway, we haven't got over yet, not until he comes along and understands that that God is dead. But when Nietzsche says God is dead, you'll see, unlike Camus, he thinks that it is the most disastrous and frightening and terrible thing you could possibly experience and discover. Because he's not a pre-Christian, a pagan, he's a post-Christian. He's somebody writing after we got hooked on this absolute supreme being. Anyway, that's why Camus isn't in the course, because I think he wouldn't think about it the way Kierkegaard, Dostoevsky, and Nietzsche do, that the most serious thing we have to deal with is that the supreme being kind of absolute doesn't exist anymore. And Kierkegaard has, has his own new absolute that's going to take the place of the traditional sort of God. We'll find out what that is. And he thinks it's still... a somehow what the, the real truth of Christianity the real truth Christianity got messed up by too much Plato and Kierkegaard will tell us what the Christians were re, Jews were really up to and Dostoevsky also doesn't believe in a supreme being but thinks he's solved he saved what's really important in the Judeo-Christian message these are what post-Christians do and then Nietzsche thinks there's nothing worth saving that the hardest thing is to get over it would be, I mean, Nietzsche's closer to Camus, or Camus's closer to Nietzsche. Nietzsche thinks the real challenge is to get over the, any version of the Judeo-Christian tradition. It's all sick. It's all wrong from the ground up. And, but, but he certainly takes it seriously, and he thinks it's very, very, very hard to get over it, and nobody's over it yet, he would say. Okay, so that's, that's sort of putting these people now, the existentialists, into the why the ones they're in are in and why the ones they're out are out. Uh, okay, now, for the rest of the 12, comments on that. I mean, again, you don't have to comment on these things, but if somebody is wanting to say something, then this is, you should raise your hand and say it. Uh, it's not, I mean, the kind of thing to discuss exactly, because until you've read the book, it's hard to have a, a discuss, discussion. That's why, let me put in a plug for this right now, it's very important to do the reading before we've got to have, do the lectures on it. Then you can, first you can understand what I'm saying, you can understand how hard it is and how amazing it is that I could say anything at all about these people and that you can too. And then, and then you can go back and reread the after you've heard the lectures, after you've been in discussion section, and then you'll see a lot more and can write your paper. But if you, do, if you come in without having read it, you're just wasting your time and you're also getting brainwashed by me so that when you finally do read it, you see it with my footprints all over it. And the point is to have your own fresh response. I've learned a huge amount over the last, I don't know, what, 25 years or whatever, teaching this course and other courses from students who see things, so students in this course who see things, big, important things that I didn't see. And I'm sure there's still many, many things to see. And I'm also sure that seeing them without having had any other uh, philosophy courses uh, is a great advantage because you haven't got blinders on. And so come and read it, and uh, we'll learn from each other. Now, I'm ready to tell you next what I think existential thinking is. And that's gotta, you've got to know that, because with, uh, Kierkegaard fits into this picture as the... Well, he says, Kierkegaard, that he's the first existential thinker. And Pascal had lots of the pieces... And uh, the Kierkegaard's got a worked out view of what it is to be an existential thinker. So we have to find out what that could mean. I saw a hand up back there. I'm sorry, just backtracking. Um, have you considered uh, covering any Eastern philosophers? Well, no, I haven't. I mean, somebody should. But one, I don't know enough about it them. But m mostly, this is a course in existentialism in literature and film. And one thing for sure is that Eastern philosophers are utterly different than, than uh, existentialists or Western philosophers. I don't think Eastern thinkers are even 
should be called philosophers. They're all thinkers. So, and it's really unfortunate we don't have more courses in the, for instance, Buddhism. Buddhism is interesting because I think it's closest to philosophy. Uh, my son has just become a super devoted Buddhist, and every time I talk to him, it's so close to Plato. And Plato went off and studied some weird stuff for a while in the, in, called the mystery religions and came back with views like the re reincarnation of souls, which he didn't have before. So I think there is some, some Buddhism in the philosophy side. But remember, the philosophy side is the side the existentialists are against. So I'll try to just... Given that my son has been giving me less lectures on Buddhism day and night sort of for the last few months, I will, I will try to put in bits of, this is Tibet, bits of Tibetan Buddhism where, where, you, where it relates to what philosophers say. Uh, I may do it all badly. My son would probably not approve, but let, I'll, I'll see if I can bring any in. Okay. Now, we're going to talk about first... Uh, well, let's put it the, the, since the, the existentialists define themselves in opposition to the philosophy tradition, we've got to find out what the essence of traditional philosophy is from the point of view of these existentialist thinkers. And they all think that the essence of philosophy got settled by Socrates and Plato in Athens in, what, 300 B.C., roughly? Yeah. I mean, I'm very bad with it. When I, I can't spell and I don't know any dates either. But here we go. So, and I'm going to try to tell you in condensed form what uh, philosophy is and what existential people have against it uh, by dividing philosophy up into three categories. We're going to talk about theory of knowledge. Let's, trade, let's take this. theory of knowledge. If you want to drop fancy talk after a, this lecture, you can call this epistemology. That's what, that's what it would be called if it in a philosophy course. Epistemology, which means theory of knowledge. And then there's ethics and there's metaphysics. I'm going to tell you in condensed form what philosophers have to say about these three categories, and then I'm going to tell you what existentialists have to say about what philosophers have to say about these three. So, knowledge. What's knowledge? Well, Plato was absolutely blown away by theory. He, they, he dis, they discovered theory, these Greeks. I mean, that's, the Egyptians didn't have theory. They were very sophisticated. They made beautiful things, and they, and they had writing, and they had gods, but they didn't have theory. Theory is, Plato found it, he thought, in math and in medicine. He was particularly impressed with what he thought doctors knew, uh, strangely enough. And, but, but they supposedly had an understanding of the human body and of disease, and math had an understanding of these eternal forms. Theory gets you at universal, timeless truths by either using reason, like in math, or by discovering the ultimate nature of, for instance, human bodies, and then you have medicine, uh, and the, the idea that you could have these universal truths, which, uh, which everyone all over would have to believe and accept once they saw the arguments for them, was absolutely amazing to Plato. It was the greatest thing since fire and the wheel, and probably what is the greatest thing. And, and how do you get theory? Well, you become a disinterested, objective observer, and so that you can discover what's true for all rational beings. That's, and if you do it right, then everybody will see what you see. And again, their math is a much better example of this than medicine, so let's stick to math. I mean, if you get a truth about triangles by disinterested, objective uh, inquiry, then it's going to be true for everybody for all times. And 
it turns out now that we believe, and it's still part of the Greek story, though Plato didn't have it yet, and natural science is theory. Because scientists also take a totally disinterested, objective attitude toward what they study. It doesn't, it, they don't get any points for give it the, whether people like their conclusions or not, or whether it will do well for getting a Nobel Prize or not. That's not what it's about. What it's about is finding out these uh, universal relations between whatever that, that you're studying. And then that will give you, Plato already thought, deep understanding and predictive power. That's, that's, what's, that, that's interesting because he sort of already understood he had a place for physics and he had a place for astronomy and he had an understanding that if you understood the theory of these things, like medicine, you could predict what was going to happen to the earth and to people. So, so there you get that. So you, science gives you, as uh, a philosopher, Thomas Nagel says, a view from nowhere. And theory is what you get when you can get so detached that you can have a view from nowhere. Descartes, when he went to do philosophy and theory, got in, in winter, retired to a warm room, he said, where he had no passions bothering him and, where, and presumably no commitments to do anything and contemplated these uh, eternal stru truths and structures. Okay, what happens in morality? Well, this kind of morality s finds out what... Uh, like a, I skipped a page. No wonder it doesn't make any sense. Okay, the, so I should say one more thing about theory. It's, a, it's great to discover theory, but there, the, the, you have to lose a lot. And you may have noticed, or maybe you didn't, well, how much you lose. Partly, you don't notice it much because here at the university, everybody's dedicated to theory. And what is, what's left out is uh, perception, because you, you use your mind, not your eyes. Skill, you're not supposed to have to have any particular uh, sort of bodily kind of skills. There's a kind of mental thing, but I'm not, let's not call that skill. I mean, I'm just calling skill the way you cope with everyday stuff that you use and so forth. Intuition, it's not fair to have intuition. I mean, you can have intuition, but it's not, it's not theory. It's not something that everybody has to believe until you can put it into language and argue for it. Gets rid of emotions, the body, tradition. That's one of the big things that uh, Kierkegaard... Kierkegaard's PhD thesis was on Socrates. And what he thought about Socrates was that Socrates had this theoretical, critical attitude that undermined the tradition and that the Athenians were probably right in at least banishing him, if not putting him to death, because it was totally uh, disastrous to try to ground the culture on these rational, detached universal principles. Every culture has its tradition, and it, you, you, but, but theory hasn't any place for that. Uh, Plato, how many read the Republic in school anywhere already? I mean, you, I mean, theory is getting out of the cave to talk Plato language. In the cave, there is intuition and bodies and uh, emotions and perspective on things and so forth. When you get out of the cave, you see things as they really are, and that is uh, the way theory sees them. Okay, now we get to ethics. So how do you do, what do you do when you get to ethics? Well, you do the same thing. You get beyond individual, personal perspectives and preferences and prejudices and desires. You want to find the universal good again, of this, the highest good for everybody. And uh, either those will be universal rules of right action, which Socrates was looking for, in the, in the euthyphro, he wanted to rule for recognizing what was the pious, that is, right thing to do. Uh, and Plato wanted to find out what all human beings really need and then how to act in order to get it. That's what the Republic is telling you. And it will follow from this that any really moral person who did understand what all human beings needed and understood the universal uh, rules for 
for getting it and for, for acting uh, rightly and having a good life, well, then though everybody would behave the same way in the same situation. I mean, insofar as there are the same situations, it's again like when you discover truths in theory, they're true for everybody everywhere. When you discover what human beings really need and what they should do to get it, it's true for everybody everywhere. And therefore, 